the interesting thing about cancer clusters, which I'm sure you guys know and have read through many of the articles that are out recently, is they're very, very difficult to uh, prove. So there, you have to have a lot of interesting, you know, a lot of good data to point to um, the fact that these cancer cases came from a, a, a certain exposure that is essentially the same amongst that cluster, right? In the case of the cancer, the cancer cluster in New Jersey, it's not just glioblastoma. It's actually um, it was found to be uh, solid primary tumors, mostly in the brain region, right? Um, and so there have been a lot of questions about whether or not this is in fact a true cluster. The most common exposure that all of the folks thus far they can determine had was attending a school in New Jersey together. So it's a pretty interesting um, phenotype, I suppose. Um, it's something that, that's worth exploring. And so I wanted to just bring this to your attention that, you know, I think some of the reason that we have a lot of um, talk about glioblastoma, especially as late, is because of this cancer cluster um, investigation. Anyone ever done any cancer cluster investigations other than this or heard of any others? So interestingly, I mean, this is sort of anecdotal information by the sidebar. Um, I worked for the CDC and I was part of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And that um, is the organization that investigates things like this, right? So we basically go on site, collect as much data we can as we can with, if it's environmental exposure, potentially we collect environmental um, samples from different um, places. Uh, we do a lot of talking to um, community members and people that live in the area. And then also do a lot of, um, of course, collecting health information and as much you know, data, as much data as we can and write a health consultation. So that's actually what's been happening at this, at this site. So, TBD, um, whether or not it's actually identified as a true cluster. If you have any questions about CDC or ATSDR, I can also help you there. <laughs> like, what the heck are they doing these days? Okay, so I, I think it's. I'm going to move that. I can't move that. So I'm sorry that it's covering the, um, the header, but. Basically, is anyone not familiar with CAR T therapy? I think we're probably a lot of us are familiar with CAR T therapy these days. It's a pretty simple um, but amazing technology. Uh, the way that it works is you have an individual that um, has a, 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 some type of um, uh, morbidity. So they have either cancer or something else, right? That they're, we're trying to um, define a therapeutic for. A lot of other therapies have not yet worked. And so what they do essentially is take. <clears throat> blood, um, including, of course, white blood cells <clears throat> from the patient. And then once they have those, they, they isolate the T cells from those, um, from that milieu. And then they essentially reprogram the T cells to recognize certain antigens. In the case of CAR-T therapy, there are a lot of different types of antigens that recognize different types of cancers, right? So it's, it's dependent on the type of cancer as to what the T cells are en engineered to recognize. It's an, it's an MHC independent recognition. <clears throat> so for all the immunologists, obviously, you have to have basically a major compatibility complex that helps prevent the antigen to, <clears throat> to another type of cell, to an um, APC or something like that, um, the antigen from any cell. So, Basically, it's an it's an MHC independent method for uh, developing our T cells to recognize um, antigen. So it's really, really been effective in certain types of cancers. The problem, of course, is that it, thus far it has not been effective in solid tumors. So in order to treat a solid tumor, you got to access that solid tumor, and that's a very difficult thing to do, especially when you're talking about brain cancer, right? So injecting injecting someone with with uh, with cells that are engineered to attack that cancer in the brain, challenge, very, very challenging. So any questions about CAR T therapy in general? I think it's just amazing, it's really cool. So moving on. So what I wanted to talk about today is this paper. So this is the paper that was uh, in Precision Oncology, one of the major uh, major journals. Um, and it's about GD2. So GD2 is an antigen that is um, has been found to be important in glioblastin. And so these uh, folks were trying to basically engineer or they have engineered T cells to recognize GD2. I'll tell you a little bit about GD2 in a minute. Um, and then they were doing you know, just experiments to figure out how they can best treat glioblastoma with this T cell, um, this CAR T therapy. So this is kind of an excellent, so GD2 is right here. I'm gonna kind of show you kind of what GD2 is, right? So if you're looking at 
you know, these, these cancer cells, they have a lot of junk on them, right? There's a lot of stuff. But there are a lot of opportunities to target different things for people to recognize them. And that's one of the challenges is finding what that target should be. And so these folks specifically chose GD2 for several reasons. The main the main reason is it's expressed on most uh glioblastoma cancer, glioblastoma cancer cells. Um, and so it's it, it's a potentially potentially a pretty uh, robust target. And it's not it's not a, it's not a target that's on a lot of other cells that we target those as well and then we do um, serious um, side effects. So that was the reason or the, the lar largely the reason for the choice of GD2. So we know, and I kind of mentioned this already, we I think I have yeah, too. So we know that glioblastoma cell lines and primary biopsies often highly express with GD2. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce it I'll just butcher um, the name of the actual peptide. Um, but it, GD2 comprises only about 1% to 2% of the total gangliosides. So that's important, right? Because we don't want to target. So again, if something that's too ubiquitous, too robust, and you're going to have a massive immune response and you're going to end up, uh, the T cell will not be specific to, uh, to kill glio or to kill the glioblastoma cells or recognize them specifically. What we don't know, or what they didn't know, was again, CAR T anti tumor activity in vitro and in vivo against these uh, glioblastoma lines, but also the patient drive cells in a, in a public. In, and autologous setting. So that's what they're trying to understand here. And so this figure is figure one from the paper. It just really shows us um, how, you know, where these GD2 cells are, uh, or excuse me, where the, the cells are that uh, uh, express GD2 are, and gives us not, gives them um, evidence that they can use GD2 as a potential uh, a target for CAR T therapy. So feel free to ask questions along the way. They use two different cell lines. So again, they use some patient-derived cells. They often, as you'll see later, um, look at some tumors. But they did use these two cell lines that both have that have the GD2 low and GD2 high um, to help determine if this was an effective treatment. So I know I can't read that. I can't read the. Um, so this is just an, another figure, kind of showing us the the T cell specific killing. So they engineered the CAR T cells. Um, and they looked at dose response, basically. So is killing happening within a dose response manner? And these, these were patient-derived um, GD2 high cells. They're pri primary glioblastoma cells, which is actually very important. So you can see kind of the dose response um, happening here, right? You can see over time, um, again, the time was 24 hours, 48 and 72. And you're looking at viability across um, the different cell lines. And so you can see this is just... Um, the GFP keys and then the dark, the dark purple bars are the actual CAR T cells. So it looks pretty good, promising. This one looks like it may actually work. And so further, um, this is a look at the actual um, cells themselves and tissue. So we, they were trying trying to um, generate or you're, what you're seeing is clusters that basically um, were used to eradicate the patient-derived primary glioblastoma cells. So you can kind of see how, again. Um, it's a little difficult to see here, but th these are basically the um, population that is red um, is the primary population, and the green is the is the cells, the, the CAR T cells killing. And you can see how they cluster. So beautiful images down here, and then they basically arrive. Okay, so this again is a look at some of the autologous um, GD2 CAR T cells. And their, their their ability to kill, to kill, but looking at the time course here, so at 48 and 72 hours, so they compared autologous and allogenic cells, um, to be allogenic, allogenic um, uh, CAR T cells, and you can see here, which is pretty interesting, that the allogenic um, cell population was definitely um, affected, and uh, as well as the autologous. So there was a question as to whether or not you could use either or both of those types of cells. Um, and in fact, we can. So that gives us an opportunity to look, you know, at taking cells from an, a different individual as opposed to um, only uh, um, um, autologous cells. Sorry. Questions about this? And then they want to look at the cytokine profile. So. In this case, they use a procardiflex assay to look at the cytokine profile. So what are the cells expressing? What kind of inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory um, growth factors are being uh, are being expressed in these in these cells? 
So often this is very important to understand the immune response that happens as a result um, of, of you know adoptive transfer of these cells back into the patient. And so for cardioplex assays, it's something for sure is determined for sure act for. Um, and what you're able to do is, is look at many different cytokines um, at the same time. So it's a multi-plex assay that allows you to investigate and understand what's happening with um, basically in, in a complete immune response in, in a small sample. And so here they're looking at transine B, um, CYP1 alpha, yeah, interferon gamma, and TNF alpha. And you can see um, so, so the, the dark, the dark black bars are the control. And then the CAR T's um, are in the gray bars. So you can see um, these are the different patients. You can see how you know the um, the immune response to the change is changing significantly in the patients that have been treated with CAR T's, or the cell lines that are treated with CAR T's. I apologize, not the actual patients, the cell lines. <laughs> My apologies. So um, yeah, you can see here you know, you have you have a pretty pretty significant grandson B response, definitely statistically significant at forty eight hours and seven days. Um, you can see it, you know, uh, um, most of these cell lines or most of the patient drive cell lines at 48 hours um, are not, not incredibly high for gamma, but then that the gamma response does go up. <clears throat> the same is true for MIP1 alpha. Um, and then TNF alpha is pretty much, there are a couple, looks like there are a couple different um, patient drive cell lines that were affected, um, but ultimately there wasn't a huge response um, with gamma, excuse me, with TNF alpha. So more cytokines, so they looked at, um, let's see, fast ligand, GMCSF, CD137 and trail, IL6 and TGF beta. So again, just kind of, we want to understand all of these um, cytokines reflected in a single well. So all the data from cytokines reflected in a single well of an IU6 surgery and full of plate. So basically it just took suits from each of the um, patient drive cell lines and then looked um, and then added uh, uh, B down antibodies to the well that then captured all of these. So the, so the response here is pretty interesting, of course. So TGF beta one, and that that's pretty robust across the board. <laughs> so the, there was some question about that and what's actually happening there. Um, but you see, you know, the trail response is pretty interesting. So, and it seems like these three, or excuse me, these four cell patient drive cell lines were particularly um, responsive, so they had a pretty significant immune response. I don't know exactly what's happening in those patients um, in addition to the CAR-T therapy, so there could be a reason for that, or there could be a reason that you know these these um, these patients, in fact, didn't have as much of a robust immune response, but, and that's just trail. So um, just looking at across the, the cytokine profile. Okay, now moving into some histology. So this is a, a picture of tumors. Um, so glioblastoma specifically being targeted with the CAR-T therapy. And you can see, um, again, this is um, CAR-T therapy down here. And these two are basically controls. So you're able to see the shrink, the tumor is actually shrinking here. Um, and then also looking at 3D cell culture down here, and you can see um, that the, um, the CAR-T cells are just um, starting to kind of cluster and help to kill and help to recognize the, um, the tumor cells. So there is another assay that I wanted to mention briefly. We can talk about that in a minute, but there's a, a really a really effective assay and way to look and target certain types of um, RNA and protein. Uh, and look at tissue at a, a different level, basically either pre organoid um, or at whole um, tissues or cells. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's called URN. And then I can't see the. So these are primary tumors. Um, so these are primary patient derived cells, and they're engrafted on. Um, uh, the nod skid model. So this is again a nod skid mouse model, and so this is basically looking at the infiltrate, how the the cells are infiltrating the glioblastoma. So I'll mention this in a few minutes, um, but again, this the view assay can really help to uh, to see things a little better. So you're you're basically looking at uh, this vessel. So one thing I think that's pretty interesting is this vessel co-option. So basically, the cells are, are clustered on vessels, and I know that that's not unique to glioblastoma. One of the questions that I've seen, or one of the things that um, I've discussed with, with some researchers more recently, and it's pretty interesting, is about you know, the clustering of cells in the vessels. 
um, and what that and how do we target those hard to reach areas, right? Um, the cool thing is, right, if it's a, if there are vessels that are in circulation, then we can potentially treat with a CAR T therapy that is not um, actual actually tumor directed, right? So you don't have to inject into the tumor. So there's a lot of work kind of under trying to understand how the vessels are important to feeding these tumors. And can we actually target the vessels that are feeding the tumors with CAR T therapy as opposed to actually having to inject the tumor straps? <laughs> and I love, I, anybody do, do you have, has anyone in here ever done an imaging cycle before with live ones? Which is so fascinating, right? Just, I, I didn't have the opportunity, I was working on a project um, during my postdoc, and we almost got to this point, but then we had a major fail. So it's pretty fascinating, right? This is looking at the central cerebral. Um, CAR T cell treatment, which is improving the um, improving the, the the survival of these mice. So you're actually looking at mice as they progress. So fascinating. Um, and I don't remember what the time course is here, um, but it's obviously the same mouse that has been treated with CAR T therapies over time, and really, really, you know, getting targeting those tumors, and it seems to be pretty effective. Again, this is in vivo treatment directly to the brain, right? So it's not, it, this is not in you know, a treatment that's circulating in circulation. Um, so that's really the main limiting factor here. So that, and that's basically, um, the, you know, what that paper was telling us. And what I wanted to talk about was how these assays, some of the assays they used to um, help to answer some of their research questions. And I think the overall answer, right, is we still need something, we still need further advances in CAR-T therapy to actually be able to, to treat um, not tumor, not, and not have to actually treat whole tumors directly. I think that's a major, um, a major limiting factor and will continue to be. But as, as that science advances, I think we have the opportunity to understand and look at what's happening um, in the immune milieu um, as a whole. And so uh, some of the assays that I work with are what are called multiplex protein assays or for car and these again allow you to flex many, many different cytokines, chemokines, growth factors. Um, we have a lot of targets for neurobiology, immuno-oncology, um, kidney disease, we have hundreds of different uh, targets available, and you're able to flex them together. So you can flex between one or 80 targets, and you get enough data, or you get data from a single well with all from um, you know, every single chemical in the cell type. So it's a pretty effective way. An efficient way to generate to generate robust data. There are a lot of different options, like I mentioned, and of course you can build your own things as well. And all of these assays use um, uh, Luminet technology. And so Gen Lab has a FlexMap 3D, which is a different version of this instrument right here. So it doesn't look like this, but it does the same thing this instrument does. All Luminet instruments basically work the same way. Um, the way that they the way that they um, um, generate these data is based on called XMAP technology. The way that I like to describe that, and I'll watch that teaching faculty, so I'll, I'll draw for our changing date. Um, so for XMAP technology, the way that I think about it um, is that you had super beakers. So imagine that you had 80 of them. One, and then to each of these speakers, you added raw meat, <laughs> kind of raw meat. <laughs> All these magic raw, and they're magnetic. Speaker one, you added a dye that was 99% red and 1% far red. So all the meats in this speaker are dyed. The top of 99% red and 1% far red. And beaker two, 98% red, 2% far red. Right? And on down the line. Okay, all the way to the to a the beaker that has a combination of red and far red. So every beaker then has a different combination of red and far red, and these would then die in unique color. So the beaker and the beaker one are different colors than these and beaker 80. And so what we do basically when we flex together, depending on how many uh, analytes you want to look at, you want to look at you know run a ten flex and generate data from ten flex and ten or whatever. We would take these from ten different colors of the different ten different beakers, 
if we would conjugate a primary antibody to each of those. So if you wanted to do, for instance, if you wanted to look at interferon gamma, like we said, did, PNCSF, and PNF alpha, we'll just do a three plus for So the need to be the same alpha as the speaker one, and we would conjugate the interferon gamma primary antibody. <laughs> We say B to be or two, and we conjugate a BMCSF primary antibody to be three GNN alpha. And then, after we have alphas and all of those, we would just mix them together and put them into dependency. And you can just take an alpha from that mixture, put it in your well, add a sample, and you capture all three of the proteins um, in, that, in that well. Does that make sense? The actual reaction. It's just like a family blood. And so if you're going to find your antibody color one, you're capturing in this case energy on gamma. You have your secondary antibody that's also part of your kit. And the last part of the reaction is start to add in B. So you have to start to add in by the reference signal. So the B is red. This is green. The instrument usually has two lasers, a red laser and a green laser, shines on the B, tells the instrument what it's looking at, and the B is like, okay, color one, I'm looking at the interferon gamma. And then how much of it's there, shines on the fat and fiber, and then quantify the body. That's how that technology works. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Pretty straightforward. That's what these folks use to look at all this. In fact, the profile side times that were. Um, Resulting from treatment of the particles in their in their uh, uh, cells, right? They took the supernatants from the cell that they incubated with the like particle therapy, and put you know 50 microliters of those in the well, and then added these and ran them on the Pretty straightforward. Okay, so that's like the next technology, just for your awareness. Um, I already described this, so I just what I just showed you was this up here, right? I just threw it over there. <laughs> There's the red and the green laser, so you know how they work. Um, so there's another assay that's run on the same instrument. It's called clonidine. The clonidine assay uses the same dye piece. The only difference with the clonidine assay so the clonidine assay, same bead. Same mark. Same bead, the color of the bead matters. And it goes to a primary antibody to be conjugated to the bead. We have probes. And those probes can then bind RNA, right? So your probe set consists of six different probes. There's one that sits right here that binds to the initial probes. These are called your label probes. These then bind your RNA. So you have these maps. The complements of your RNA. They're blocking probes that help to stabilize the molecules and make the RNA not very stable. And then there are label probes that bind to your sequence too. You have one, two, three, four, five, six probes per construct that are designed to bind to your target sequence. After that, you just amplify the sequence off with off of redound RNA, which is called branch DNA technology amplification. So you basically have these are all PE little PE you know, molecules that are that are amplifying signal. <laughs> so again, laser times the B. What am I looking at? I'm looking at cleansing the B. I'm looking at an interferon gamma B. I'm looking at whatever, whatever B, whatever thing we don't have a we don't have antibodies for, right? Um, but what it is, and then up here again, this is all PE. So how much of it there? So that's called the clonidine assay. Again, from about 80 genes per well. It's really straightforward. It's really good with FFPE as well. <laughs> Looking at degraded RNA, it's a fantastic assay for capturing data from samples that have been sitting around for a long time. You don't know what to do with them. <clears throat> These folks um, were using it to look at um, FFPE samples, and they were trying to make sure that they had multiple sites. They were trying to look at intra and inter laboratory specificity and um, uh, uh, consistency to ensure that nothing was kind of going wrong in uh, generating data from these. So this is what you're looking at. They were looking specifically at um, unstained FFPE tumor sections of breast cancer patients. So a lot of 
you know, breast cancer patients, we have you know, samples, but we don't know what to do with them because we basically exhausted um, uh, the usefulness of, you know, the tissue itself. And we have, we, we don't want to waste it because it's incredibly important. So what can we do with it? We, we put it in FFPE and, and keep it around for a long time. And then we have to figure out can we generate data from that so we can. Um, and I'll show you how that works. So this basically just shows you they did a fantastic job. I don't, you know, it's really good. The assay is very, very easy. They had really good consistency across labs and inside inside their in labs. But this is the way the assay works. Um, it's licensed. Mm -hmm. You don't have you don't extract RNA. You don't convert to cDNA. So it's direct from lysate. Mm -hmm. Any sample type, so FFPE, whole blood, fresh or frozen tissues. Um, I've you know I've looked at uh, chicken tissues and blood. I've looked, we've looked at plants. Uh, plant tissues, um, yeah, basically anything you can imagine, and any target. So it's just like we designed a probe, just like anybody designs probes for Tacman or whatever it may be. So there's no limitation. Um, it can be um, non coding RNA, it can be um, un genes that aren't being treated yet, or whatever, whatever you're interested in trying to quantify. So again, you can quantify up to 80 genes per well. Um, so the first step is just your sample prep, which is very straightforward. You just basically homogenize to break open your cells and you add protein to K. Get rid of the protein, right? So break open your cells, get rid of the protein. A lot of people do the protonoplast, the protein assay, and the formagene assay in tandem. So they'll take their cells, they'll send them down, take the soups, do the protein assay, and then they'll take the cells, break them open, and do the formagene assay. So you have data for both, um, or you know, again, tissue, Break your tissue open, take the suits, do the protein assay, take your tissue, uh, the actual tissue with the RNA and do the tissue expression assay. People do that if they, you know, um, are wanting trans transcriptionally and translational data from the same samples. Um, so anyway, so you just get your lysis mixture and then you add that to the beads with the probes that I kind of threw up here before. And then you add all of your probes that are designed for each of your genes. So again, we design a set for up to 80 genes per well. And then after that, you just hybridize everything together, and then you amplify your signal and build this little amplification tree and read. So it's a straightforward and simple as that. The data are directly comparable to qPCR. You include all of your housekeeping genes in your plat set and your well. So if you're looking at like you know 20 experimental genes, you also throw in your PPIB, your beta actins, all of your expression is relative to your housekeeping genes. So that's how you you quantify just like any other uh, gene expression estimate. Questions about that? Yeah. So regarding the comparison to PCR, how many cats equals the the cost? So the cost. Yeah. So the cost the cost from RNA extraction through the packing is exactly the same as the cost of the whole kit. So like they've done like a protocol of you got to get this kit to extract your RNA, and then you got to get this kit to clean up your RNA. Then you have to convert to CDNA, and have your CDNA kit, and then you have to have your packaging kit, right? That's the whole process for QPCR. So, G for G is very much the same cost. So, the kits are expensive because we're doing 80 Gs, right? And the kits are sold modular. <coughs> so, the way that they're sold, there, there's a single processing kit, there's an assay kit, and there's a pro set. And so they're sold that way so that basically you can, if you have two different sample types, you don't have to buy an entire new whole thing with two different sample types. And if you want, you can run multiple runs per plate. So if you want to do, you know, you want to do cells here and then you want to take a tissue, you can know, take a tissue to do it at the second part of the plate you can. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, but yeah, gene for gene, it's very much aligned with that. Minimum order, uh, minimum order. Right. So yeah, so you have to, so you would buy, you're, you get a probe set for enough probes to fill a plate. And again, you can do anywhere from three genes. So if you wanted to do three genes, it's much less expensive than doing 80, right? So it's, again, it's totally flexible. So you can have, uh, so for example, um, Bonky was in here, he, he's doing a, a Six plus, I think. So six genes, which includes the top keepers, right? And then you have the assay kit, and you have the simple process. The simple process is kit is like less than hundred dollars. The pro set looks expensive, and it's it, it, the cost of the pro set is based on the number of genes. 
number of folks that are designed to find your RNA, right? So if you do 80, 80 is you know, the max, right? It's more expensive than doing the fiber trade. So I mean, the number of samples that you know, you can make this. So you could the kit is just like, yeah, so you, you don't have to do my sick, but you can do and, and you can run your plate as many times as you want. If you have three samples, if you have 40 samples, so you have enough, the volume is enough to do, you know, do the well, but just for you to conserve your reaction. I think the limit of detection. Limited detection, great question. So the limited detection of quantity in general is like 200 copies. So it's sensitive. Um, and you're in one thing, another good application of this assay is for siRNA or miRNA. Uh, so because you're not reliant on uh, a, a sequence magnification and you're not reliant on, C, on CP values to detect your difference in gene expression, you're only reliant on actual differences in fluorescence. You can detect smaller differences that are statistically significant between genes, right? So, like for siRNA, that's particularly important. So, if you have your control and you have your SI, you want to you want to look at that knockdown. So that's one of the most um, commonly common applications of this assay. That it's a simple enough problem. Do you want to find genes? Yeah, so it's totally this way. So, I mean, I've had people and that's my, what my talk is because I'm fine. But so, people will say, I'm, I'm going to look at an inflammatory pathway that's induced by X, Y, or Z, and I'll design a panel for you. Or you can send me a list of things that you're interested in looking at. There's no limitation whatsoever. You can design any species, any sample size, any genes, even if they're not genes. I mean, even if it's just sequence. So, I have a list of sequences. But I definitely can help with design a panel. Uh, based on um, what your product is and what you want to What is the error rate of detection? The what? Error rate. The error rate of detection. Oh, error rate. Compared to two people. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. So the C, but I mean, you, but the, 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 so, CP, do I have a, I might actually have something. I want to say like 98%. You're, yeah, you're like very rare. Uh, the specificity of the app, so because of the six, the way the pros are designed, and you have six pros per concept, and, you, and, and also because I'm like, I don't need this coming. So it's not like you only have one construct per piece, you have many constructs on every piece. And so, essentially, in order for and so in order for any of this to bind and they can see only amplify, you have to have all six of these probes totally down. If, if at any place along in, in the process of adding probes and something doesn't bind, the rest of the contract doesn't be created, right? So you have to have both of the label extenders bind. You have to have both of the blocks of probes bind. You have to have them both of the label probes bind. So if at any point something doesn't bind, you won't get a support. You won't get a solution. But you're also not reliant on sequence amplification. So if you have a graded RNA, you can still get a signal because you're just finding the you're just finding the place on this on this you know construct. So you have you know, you're not if you're missing a nucleotide here, you won't it's not gonna necessarily bind here, but it's generally speaking, it's not because it's not amplification based, you still get a signal. Does that make sense? You're not yeah, amplifying with the greater RNA, you have to have a state as well. So any kind of amplification, they say it's hard at One thing that the time the assay can't detect is yes, it's not sensitive enough to test the text of the say aside polymorphisms. So um, but we can detect things like methylation in it, so different like that is genetics. Um yeah, there's a lot of possibilities. Um so there's the construct on there. I already showed that to you. So I was not, I'm not going to talk about this. I mean, this is so Jen has an instrument that's very comparable to this instrument. This is um, one of the new Luminex instruments it's called the Teleflex um, dual reporter side eject. And she she's very pretty. Um, I like to say that she's the iPhone of Luminex instruments, very, very intuitive, easy to operate. 
really, really large diamond frame system. It's a really nice instrument overall. There's a lot of good really good functionality. Um, you can do just this, this new instrument can collect a ton of data because it has the ability to do um, has two recorder um, laser sewage in by one this year and later this year. You'll definitely have access to it. But hopefully that you very well made, right? Because it's it's a really great um, system to have. So I also wanted to mention because right, like more importantly, what do you do with all this data? So you can generate a ton of data in a single plate, right? So much data is kind of overwhelming. It's like when you get seek data that back, you get the RNA seek or like, whoa, okay, great. What do I do this track? So we have data analysis uh, tools that are super, super easy to use and make uh, generating uh, data quickly very easy. I personally love, we, um, I would mean, I bet all of us love Prism, right? Prism is beautiful for making figures. Like you can't, you can't use them or something. That's just where I love to make things to put in paper. But this is a great place to start and you can throw it in Prism after you do all your analysis and you can generate your figures there. So basically there's a data analysis app for the protein for Cardiflex assay and a data analysis app for the quantum gene assay. They're free, there's no cost to them. You take your CSV files that you get from Jen after he generates your data for you, and you just drop them, drag and drop them right into the data analysis app, generate all of our standard curves for you. You can 80 flex, you get 80 standard curves, you just have to go through and keep seeing them, but you don't have to make them and they sell. Yay, right? A huge, huge, huge time saving. Um, generate heat maps for you, uh, group wise comparisons, all that. And then the same thing with the quantum gene assay, you'll, it'll do your relative expression. So you can tell it, you can tell the software which genes are your housekeepers, which genes are your experimental genes. It does the math for you. It shows you your things are high, low, you know, expression level, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's it's really, uh, a really, I love it for, um, uh, and LumenX Corporation uh, recommends using these data analysis tools as well. So. There's a three four wall version. If you need to give us kind of samples, I'm sure Jim would love to help you with the three four well uh, kit. So what the one big difference between Thermo and other companies that sell these kits is that we have um, kits that are actually optimized, designed to run at with those miniaturized uh, uh, reagent volumes. So you know it's a rare thing that you're gonna have. To, I mean, I have to do some of that work myself. Um, when I have a ton of samples and a ton of genes. So it just depends on what you need, but it's flexible. Same, this is all the optimization. And then I'm gonna finish by talking a little bit about the view assay that I mentioned before and saw some pictures. And the paper, they didn't use view RNA for those um, images, but a lot of them, they used you know, some a variety of different uh, methods. One of which is, of course, in, in CG hybridization, right? We all probably have some experience with fish um, at some level. And so we have some really, really cool assays that use the branch DNA technology to amplify the signal off of your bound RNA, uh, but in situ, right? So you can actually look at genes in cells or tissue or genes in tissue and localize where those genes are being expressed at a single molecule level. So you can actually not only know the genes being expressed, but see where it's being expressed, right? So it gives you another line of evidence, another line of data. So these um, assays, like I said, are called uRNA. And so the uRNA assay, these are just some pretty pictures, right? Um, <laughs> you're able to look at three to four gene targets um, in addition to as many uh, proteins as you want based, and based on the, 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 the functionality of your uh, imager, right? So if you have 10 channels, which I don't know that anyone has an imager or 10 channels, but you have 10, you can do 10 color, uh, view plus protein, right? So it's just that that's the only limitation here. So again, you get single copy sensitivity, and you can also do this on a high content imager if you have access to one of those. Uh, so this is really just showing you the ability to look at single molecules. So here you're looking at exons two to nine, here two to 20, you have a red and a green fluorophore. These images are offset a little bit, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the individual mm -hmm. molecules, but basically these are the same molecule, just a little bit offset. Um, so these two pieces of RNA, just to kind of show you the sensitivity of that. Um, this is a beautiful picture of IL-8 and IL-6 gene expression. These are not proteins, these are genes. So the green is IL-8, the ATNS is the control part is in here, and then of course DAPI, no, it's just DAPI. Um, but you can see um, the co-localization, right, of the IL-6 with the ATNS, and then the DAPI right in the middle where it should be. 
Um, and this up here is the IL-8. Um, again, the epigraph should be in the rest of the, the cell I got as um, ATS. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really cool. It helps to, we now also have um, an Alexa floor version of the, um, sorry, talked about that. We have an Alexa floor version of the tissue assay. So it used to just be we had fast red and fast blue. We the same tissue. Now we can actually same tissue the Alexa floor. So the same thing for the color of Alexa floor. We can look not just the cell down, but also the tissue. Um, so it's really a robust way to understand where things are happening in your cell in the tissues. So I already mentioned the ProHardoflex. This is the data analysis staff. I already talked about that. This is the quantity data analysis staff. And this is the storefront or storefront. This is like the where you drag a drug for files, literally stuff like that. You can log on for the firm image for any firm image for log on uh, your data analysis there. So yeah, um, this is a very overwhelming example of a quantum gene panel. So <laughs> this happens to be a SARS-CoV-2 quantum gene panel. It's a good example of what you can do with the quantum gene analysis. It's just a 50 plus. So looking at 50 genes, what we can see here, is you're looking at you know, the ORFs, so the PAN-PRO plus the individual genes in the open reading frames. Um, then you're looking at the viral infection process genes, so RNA um, from polymerase, the S protein temperates, if you know is really important, ACE2 A and uh, A2, and then some uh, signal transduction stuff, so NF kappa beta, the envelope protein, DTP, the TPP4. Um, this this flex set also includes a pan pro blue and RSV to make sure the person actually has SARS CoV 2, not blue or RSV. And then the immune profile of that actual host. So you're generating viral gene expression data and host immune response data simultaneously. So you're getting all of the immune profiling data for all those gene cytokine storm data for um, all of these genes, and then um, your housekeeper should be out there. So this is just an example of a panel, totally modifiable. You can look at four of these, you can look at 30 more. Um, it's anything you need, but just to kind of give you a visual of what's possible with the Questions about that? Cool. Um, we, I'm not going to talk through SARS. You don't care about SARS CoV 2 stuff at this point, I don't think. <laughs> Anybody care about SARS CoV 2 stuff right now? Research? Okay. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I would love to work with you guys. Um, I can do whatever I can to support you in any of your areas of research. This is my information. Uh, my card is in the back table. Please make sure that Brian doesn't use Brian in if you have it. Um, I love to design experiments, troubleshoot, get into the you know nitty gritty. I'll come and stand by you and help with pet pet. Mm -hmm. I taught someone to pet pet at CDC like two months ago. It blew my mind. So I'm happy to do. Um, I'll get in there in the trenches with you. Um, I still have good pet petter fingers. They'll work well. Um, so yeah, so please let me know how I can support you and help you. I just uh, yeah. The basis for the next testimony is a two major events. One the solo, second one stigma, third one is uh, bioed, yeah, and another one is rapid. Yeah, what's the difference in the That's a great question. <laughs> so there's so every basically all of the companies that they're all competitors essentially. Um, and, they can, and any of those assays can run on the Luminex platforms. Um, the biggest distinguisher between our kits and others, number one, no one else has quantity. So we're the only people that have the gene expression assay. And in regard to the protein multiplex assay, um, our assays are more, have been proven to be more robust. So they compare, you know, when they develop the assays, they compare to other assays that are made by the same vendors or different vendors. So the number of beads in the plus set are, are greater. And the antibody tears are much more robustly vetted. So we spend a lot of time trying every kind of combination of antibody pair to make sure we're not binding, there's no non specific binding, there's not aggregation, um, and that we're getting, we're ca truly capturing the proteins that we're intended to capture and make sure there's no antigenic drift because that can also be a problem in all of it. So there's a lot of attention and detail, plus the number of beads. So, you know, more beads is, is, is important. So obviously if you don't have enough beads, you're going to get lower detection and it's crappy. So, um, so yeah, so we do stand out there. So I would always say if you, have, if you haven't had success with it, someone else's hit, try ours. I'm happy to like help you with that. Um, usually people can get yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
Please, anybody that's still hungry, you know, we want you to uh, 